What is going on everybody? Welcome to the final episode of this giveaway series with our DRZ400, our CB650R, and our Ninja400. Today is a bit of a send off for all these motorcycles. We're gonna be doing some final thoughts on them and just kind of sending them off into that good night because on March 7th at midnight, that is the last, well, let me rephrase it, at March 7th at 11.59.59, Right before March 8th is the final cutoff you have to get your entries in. If you use the code BIGBOSA2019, we're gonna put it here on the screen so you don't miss it. Hit the link down below to yemmynewmerch.com. Use that code and I will give you 10% off your entire order and 10X entries to win. If you don't like those odds, you can always hit the link down below on yemmynoob.co and that will also get you 10X entries. If you get a $20 package to enter our Discord server and everything else, you get 200 entries to win. Make sure you're Entered. Don't miss out because you just got a few more days left to win these bikes. So without further ado, let us wrap up our thoughts on these bikes. All right, so I thought it'd be fun to start off this video by kind of going over who should own which of these bikes. I think that's a lot of things that we get DMs about, people talking to us about like, oh, I'm looking at this bike versus this bike. So I think let's just kind of go over what the target audience is for each bike. So Spite, who do you think the target audience for the Ninja 400 is? Well, I mean, so yeah, there's a target audience, but I honestly think that it, literally anybody could own one of these. Somebody who's coming back from a bigger bike, someone who's just starting out, uh, someone who wants a track day toy, someone who wants something that's a little more low stakes for the street. Yeah. This thing, it, pretty much anyone can own it. I mean, it's, I still stand by that statement I made where I think this is my favorite of the, the three bikes here, despite this being an awesome bike and me having bought a DRZ, yeah. I still think this is the most fun because you can literally just sit there and wring its neck and it just, it wants to play. Yeah. So really anybody could go buy one of these and be totally happy. Uh, if you perhaps own an, uh, another bike, a bigger bike, you'll be a little bit happier with this if you're an experienced rider. Because yeah. it, it is gonna leave a little something to be desired uh, in terms of your, you know, top end rush, yeah. but it's just such a fun little machine. Yeah, the Ninja just epitomizes that theory of it's more fun to ride a slow bike fast than a fast bike slow. And I think that's why guys like me and you jump on it and we're like, you can just use all of this thing on the street. Yeah. It's a ton of fun. You just get to ring out literally first through fourth gear without getting into too much trouble. Exactly. You know, if you ring out first through fourth gear on this thing, you're, you're in trouble. Yeah, yeah. That, that's go to jail fast. That's go to jail fast, yeah. Um, I think the Ninja makes a great option for anybody starting out. I think literally anybody could jump on that bike and learn how to ride it. It's pretty unintimidating, pretty easy to ride. Um, one thing about the Ninja as well, as opposed to its competition, is it's relatively comfortable. The R3 is a little bit more pitched forward. The RC390 is definitely way more pitched forward. So this bike, I think, makes a strong case for that street ability, that everyday rider kind of bike. Uh, the 400 is just awesome. I've had a ton of fun riding it. Um, yeah. It's really, really sweet. And there's a, for it being relatively new, there's a shockingly deep aftermarket for it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've got nice Evotech stuff on here now, but I mean, you could go to any of your big parts suppliers like Puge or uh, Rizoma, and they'll have something that can go on this bike. Oh yeah. Even though it's it's a really fresh addition to the beginner bike segment. Yeah, and talk about ease of install on a lot of these things as well. Since the Ninja doesn't have a whole lot going on with it, it's a more simple and compact bike. Slip on exhaust, easy to install, you know, tail tidies, simple as hell. You had a little bit of trouble with the frame sliders though, right? I will say though, the fairings on this are way easier to pull off than on a bigger bike like my VFR 800 yeah. or something like an R6. Uh, they really just kind of fall off eventually. You just remove enough bolts and they you literally have to pull them free. Whereas on mine, you have to kind of like move it around. There's always a master link that's holding it in place. Feels like you're gonna break something. Yes. Uh, yeah. I didn't find that with this when I was ripping the fairings off. Um, yes, it took forever, <laughs> but uh, it was a lot easier than some of the more complex motorcycles. Yeah. 
No, the Ninja is a great platform. And I think in talking about it in a competition environment, off the, the road type of thing, so on a track environment, I found the Ninja to be really predictable, actually set up pretty well out of the box. I think you would just want to do a couple things to it to make it a little bit more track focused if that was your goal with it. But this bike, you can take the track super easy, have a great time, and it works really, really well. Um, so yeah, the Ninja, I think for me, is a solid like eight out of 10 bike, I would say. Yeah, and, and I think if, if you wanted to make it a full 10 out of 10, there's just a handful of things you need to do, really. Uh, yeah. I mean, the mirrors are okay. They're a little far of a reach, so some bar ends wouldn't be a miss. Yeah. Uh, that, I think, is a miss for me on this bike is those mirrors being really far out. They're kind of awkward to position and maneuver when you're on the bike. Yeah, So and, and then, you know, use your mirror block offs here and throw some bar ends, and this bike looks really stealthy, especially in this black. Yeah. Uh, you could maybe use a taller windscreen, but not by much. Yeah. Uh, maybe if they have a cushier seat. Uh, honestly, it's, I think it's pretty much done. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a great little machine, and Kawasaki did a really good job putting it together. Yeah, and and we were talking about it as well with that slip on and the looks that it has. You know, it's just more aggressive than it has any right to be going down the road. Yes, it yeah. really it, it really does have that kind of show stopping ninja. Uh, it, it, it looks like a big bike. It looks like yeah. a 600, looks like a 1000. Hell, it even looks like the H2 a little bit. A little bit? Yeah. So it, it, they really do have their design philosophy down when it comes to the Ninja line. Yeah. Yeah, so I really like the Ninja overall, an 8 out of 10 for me. Spite, what do you think? Yeah, I think an 8 out of 10 is a fair number. Uh, yeah. It's There's no, no real qualifications to it. It's just a very good motorcycle. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the CB650R. Probably the, the favorite of us uh, among this group, yeah? Probably, yeah. I would say that this is the most desirable of oh, our yeah. motorcycles. Yeah, we've gotten probably more comments and DMs about this one than, than any of the other bikes we've done. Every time we posted a video about the giveaway series, someone's like, man, I hope I win that CB. So people are really stoked on it. And I think, honestly, it's just down to the way it looks. This bike is just so pretty. Oh yeah, it's it's very, very gorgeous. It, it, everything yeah. from the exhaust pipes to the bronze on it. It's, that light at the front, it's just so cool. Yeah. So, so cool. There, there's literally nothing more aside from maybe bar and mirrors that needs to be done to that motorcycle yeah. uh, and that's just down to what honda put on it it's all really good from the factory yeah uh, i think for me and i remember when we bought it it was a standout feature for me i was like oh this bike has show a suspension at the front but it's not adjustable i was like that's a pretty top end component for something like this and then on the road, you really feel that kind of more sophisticated suspension as opposed to something like the Ninja that has these kind of, you know, more utilitarian 41 millimeter forks versus these bigger forks from Showa uh, that just makes it a more sophisticated ride going down the road, a little bit nicer to live with every day. Uh, and then again, you know, just talking about how pretty this bike is, it's the little features on it. You got the stitching here on the back, the cool retro Neo thing, light going on at the front, LEDs front and rear, which is cool. Turn signals that we don't see from Yamaha, but we do see on the Honda. And of course that four cylinder soundtrack is pretty, pretty good. Yeah, honestly, it's, it, every time I look at it, I see the remnants of my 919, you know, mm -hmm. it's, Clear it's, lineage. It's very clear. They've been working on these four-cylinder bikes forever, and yeah. they've basically nailed this power plant. It's so smooth. It's so playful, too. Even though it's putting down close to 100 horsepower, you can really just have a lot of fun with it. Oh, know? yeah. This is a bike that I feel, I feel like this amount of power, about 100 horsepower, is the very limit of what you can still use about 100% on the street, yeah. you know, without getting into too much trouble. Like this bike, we'll take it out on some twisties and I'll regularly kind of, you know, second gear, ring it out wide open all the way to the top and still have a good time with it. Whereas like once you start getting to the 120, 130 horsepower range, it starts getting a little dicier to really push on a bike like that. But this bike out of the box in the street works really well and you can still have a lot of fun with it. Oh, totally. And you know, it, just going back to that out of the box, it's, it's pretty much done. You know, yeah. that you don't have to, you don't have to do anything. And so perhaps it's maybe not your modifier's dream, but for somebody who just wants a bike that looks good, sounds good, minimal effort. I mean, everybody knows all you need to do to a Honda is change the oil. Yeah. So it's, it's a, just a great machine for anyone who wants a simple, perfect bike. Yeah, I'd say it's one of the bikes that we've had in the garage that is just really turnkey. You know, mm -hmm. it's like you get on it, ride it, it's done, it's good to go. Um, 
It feels every bit as nice as the price tag suggests on it. So don't be scared if you're looking at getting this bike, you're thinking, man, that bike's gonna cost me nearly $10,000. Riding it down the road, it feels like a $10,000 motorcycle. It feels awesome to ride. It feels like a nice place to be. It feels premium when you're on it. You look down at the gauges, you look down at your controls, you look down at the, the bronze and the paint. It's, it's high quality stuff, even though it comes from a big four, don't let that discourage you. Honda makes a really nice bike coming from a guy who's owned three in the last couple of months it's it's just it's you can feel every bit of that honda quality there's nothing's rattling loose no it's just it's so thought through but in that sense it does feel a little committee-esque uh it, it it's feels, a little clinical yeah it's very some people would call it soulless i think it's just a little plain but once you get it really going it really wakes up and comes alive yeah so you you do have to kind of balance what what you're thinking about do you want a bike with a lot of attitude or do you want a bike that is just ready to go no matter what you do to it yeah speaking of attitude i think i'm one of the prime competitors for this bike both in the upper segment and the lower segment would be mt07 mt09 right you talk about yes. a bike with attitude both of those have plenty of attitude but you're sacrificing some of the put together feeling that the Honda has. When you ride the MT-09, you ride the MT-07, you know, they feel kind of, you know, wonky, kind of goofy, kind of light and playful and, and kind of scrapped together in that way because Yamaha builds their bikes like that. But mm -hmm. the Honda just feels put together, nice, committed, simple, uh, and it's really great. So who do you think should buy this bike, Spike? I would give this bike an audience of somebody about our age, mid twenties, looking for something, and maybe even a little older, thirty something, with a little bit more. I'm pushing. I'm pushing cash. beyond my mid twenties at this point. Uh, but. A little bit more disposable cash to bring together somebody who wants uh, a bike that says a little bit. It is more of a status symbol than perhaps some of the other starter bikes. Yeah. Because you are talking about a bike that is. It really is the top end of the beginner bike segment. Absolutely. You really end, yeah. can't spend much more on a beginner bike. So, and, and again, you also have to think if you drop it, that's going to be a really unpleasant experience. It's especially since it's naked, it's got everything exposed. That's not going to be a fun time if you drop this bike. So somebody who's a little bit more responsible in general, uh, with a little bit more cash to put into it yeah. is probably, you know, late 20s, early 30s, thereabouts. You know what I just thought of? I get a lot of comments of people who are maybe considering going Ducati for their first bike, right? They're looking at maybe like something, the Monster, maybe one of those bikes, a Scrambler, and those are, you know, eight to $9,000 bikes. This might be a competitor for them, honestly. You're getting more performance out of it. It's a little bit more to manage, yep. but at the same time, you know, it's red, it's kind of expensive. It feels great when it's going down the road. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking of becoming a first time Ducatista for your first bike, maybe look at this too, honestly. I know it's a weird cross shop, but I think this makes sense if that's what you're kind of trying to get into. It's way more reliable too, and it's gonna yeah. be cheaper to maintain. For sure. So I could, I I hadn't thought about it, but yeah, this could punch above, into the you know Italian, European market as yeah, well. Yeah, if you're looking for that first time bike. Uh, but again, you know, something with nearly 100 horsepower, th this is very much the upper limit of something you could start on. Uh, but again, because the way it makes its power, not too unmanageable, a pretty simple motorcycle to ride as long as you're not stupid with the throttle. Uh, so rating, what do you think? Oof, this one's, this one's a little bit tougher for me. Yeah. Uh, I love everything about it, but that price point kind of brings it down. And then in terms of like the beginner quality of it, yeah. I got to dock it just a little bit. I'd probably give this an eight out of 10 as well. It would be a 10 out of 10 if you had the money for it and you could uh, you know, really appreciate the fact that it's just done. Yeah. But if you're looking for a project to do on it, there's really nothing there for you. No. So for me, it's it's an eight. Maybe I could even bring it down just a little bit more. Yeah. But it's it's a phenomenal motorcycle that needs nothing else. Yeah. Kind of going off your point there where it's like it's not a project bike. I could see this bike as someone like, let's say, 
they're a diehard Honda guy, right? Maybe they have this as their daily bike. They take it to work, they take it to a track every once in a while. And then in the garage, they've got like an old CB750 or something they're wrenching on and fixing up just to get that passion out, you know? Totally. Uh, so this is definitely not that type of bike if you wanna do projects and stuff like that. For me, I think I'm gonna give it an eight and a half out of 10. All right. And the reason I'm giving it an eight and a half out of 10 is because this is one of the funnest bikes at the track out of the box that I've ever ridden. Um, it was surprisingly capable, surprisingly predictable. All it needs, again, going back to that thing where it's like, it doesn't need much, like all it needs is a stickier set of rubber with the more aggressive V shape. This thing's an absolute blast on track. Um, I did not expect it to be so good, especially considering that you can't really adjust the suspension at all, but it's super, super fun. And this is one of the few bikes we've had where every time I get off, I always gotta look back a little bit because I'm like, man, this thing looks so cool. So I gotta <laughs> give it an eight and a half out of 10. I really enjoyed having it in the time that we had it. So yeah, amazing motorcycle. What's holding it back in your opinion then? Uh, I think, you know, I do like my motorcycles with a bit of attitude, a bit of quirks, a bit of features, you mm -hmm. know, Doug DeMuro would say on YouTube. Um, I do like a little bit of weirdness to my bikes. That's why I've always leaned towards the Europeans. That's why in my stable now, I've got the Daytona and the RC and the Hayabusa, I guess, and the Ducati. Wow, so I got three out of four quirky European bikes. So I guess I just, that's my, my kink or fetish when it comes to motorcycles. But uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're just, I don't know, this is missing a little bit of that je ne sais quoi for me, because I'm gotcha. a bit of a snobby biscotti boy, I guess. I gotta have a little something. <laughs> I, want, I want them to start kind of weird every once in a while. I want them to wake, make weird sounds. And this is just a little too perfect for me. And mm -hmm. I know a lot of people are gonna be like, that's a ridiculous reason to not like a motorcycle, but I don't know, like for me, I just, I like my bikes to be a little bit weird. I know? totally get that. I totally understand that. Yeah. Just that way, like if someone asked me about them, you know, they have a little bit of character to them, a little soul, and this is a little cold to me, you know, but uh, still a, f a phenomenally good bike to ride and, you know, goon around town with. I had a lot of fun with it. Agreed. Yeah. Now, speaking of gooning around town and soul and character, let's talk about the DRZ. <laughs> oh, and I want to get your God. opinion first on it because you started off with this bike and you were like, what even is this thing? Yeah. And now you own one. So that's a complete 180. So talk yeah. to me about it. Uh, I hope it's not going to start a trend of me buying one of the bikes that we have in the giveaway series. Well, one of our new giveaway bikes you're really into right yeah, now. Yeah, because that's, that's going to be an expensive habit. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, Honestly, this is the bike that needs the most seat time to understand. Um, for someone who is just a street rider, it makes no sense when you get on it at first. It feels oh God, weird. No. Yeah. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't run right because it's just, it shakes and judders. Yeah. Uh, the carburetor is strange. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's such a bare bones utilitarian thing that it really does take a hot minute for you to actually get, okay, I understand what I'm meant to be doing on this bike. Uh, and once you do, there's so much fun to be had on it. And it's a real shame that, you know, the videos haven't been doing so well with it because I'd love to be able to experience more of these dual sports. Yeah, I think that's one thing that is a shame is people, I mean, we posted tons of videos about the DRZ, uh, point blank, no one gives a sh about this bike. <laughs> it's just no one is interested in it, which again, to your point is a shame because in the right kind of hands and characteristics and environment, this is the funnest bike out of the three by far. Oh yeah. By far. Like you get on this thing, you just want to jump curbs and pop wheelies and slide the rear wheel around. It's just an absolute hooligan bike. Um, it's super, super fun. But to your point, if you've only ever ridden street bikes, if you've only ever had fuel injection, this thing is a, a really different world. I mean, there's times where I'm moving around the garage and doing stuff with it. And I'm like, why the f when it start? And then I check the car, and I'm like, oh, it's on reserve and I got to flip it over. Yep. And then it, it's, it, it runs kind of funny and you got to adjust the idle. You're like, man. So it's, it's just a lot more involved to own. And it really takes you back to some older days of motorcycling. This is just what they all used to be like in a weird way. You know, they weren't all, you know, this refined and easy to ride and simple. A lot of them kind of, you know, clattered and rang along like the DRZ here. Yeah, and I mean, it's just, it really is a blast to ride. Oh once God, once yeah. you understand what it's going for, and it really isn't going for anything other than just do stupid stuff. Yeah. It wants you to do dumb stuff. It wants you to pick the wheel up. It wants you to hop curbs. It wants you to, you know, go down a dirt road. Yeah. Anything that you want to do, aside from maybe some serious aggressive track work, 
this thing can do it. Yeah. You know, it's it's so it's it's a jack of all trades and a master of none, really. Yes. Yeah. I think the DRZ is truly the new age scrambler idea of a bike. Much like you said, it's like jack of all trades, master of none. Like this thing's not going to win any stoplight races. It's definitely not going to tear up any twisties with any like sport bikes. Um, it's definitely not going to rip down any trails like a proper dirt bike will. But it can still do all those things. Yeah. You know, it can still do them and happily do them. Um, and I really think that's down to the weight of it, right? So if you've never been on something like this, uh, you know, this bike weighs, I think, like 318 pounds versus this, which I think weighs like 440. That weighs about 360, 350, something like that. So these types of bikes, you know, just like the WR250, the GRC400, they're much lighter weight than any other bike that you've ever been on. So the first thing you notice when you take off with it is just how nimble and light it feels. It just feels like it's on its tippy toes. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and it carries its weight in a really peculiar way because it's got so much suspension travel, yeah. such, uh, so much ground clearance, its weight's really kind of high up. Yeah. So you can feel it kind of tipping and you don't you don't stick your knee out, you kind of stick your shoulders out yeah. when you're leaning over. It's a completely different riding experience, but it's just so much fun. Yeah. You know, because it's because it's so different yeah. is why it's and, and I mean, if you've been that bike, who cares? Uh, yeah. Because literally all of the plastics on that motorcycle you can buy on Amazon for a hundred bucks. You drop one of these bikes, oh. and you're talking about five, six hundred dollars worth of repairs. I mean, it's, it can even go higher from there. This thing's indestructible. Literally, yeah. To give you guys an idea of the DR platform's indestructibility, I was out in Mexico in November, and we were doing this big, you know, adventure ride out there. I was on my scrambler, and there was a guy in front of me who had a DRZ 400. And he hit this weird rut in the asphalt road and he just went down at like 40 miles per hour, sparks flying everywhere. He rolled off into the grass. You know, he, thankfully he was okay. We went and looked at the bike. The bike was better than he was. There was nothing on it. It, it, it was fine. <laughs> it was crazy. Like there was nothing wrong with the bike. He started it right up and just went on. Yeah. So these bikes, because they're built for off-roading and trail environments, man, they're damn near indestructible, just like you said. And they're also a great learning platform. Yeah. And this is, this is, perhaps why I bought mine, the more I think about it, is I was thinking about getting a Sportster because I wanted something that I could wrench on in kind of a low stakes environment. And then I found this, it was $2,300. And so far I've changed spark plugs for the first time. I've uh, adjusted carburetors for the first time, pulled gas tanks all the way off, adjusted petcocks. I mean, I'm getting ready to do a valve job on mine and I'm not that worried. It's a great worried. place to start with that. Yeah. yeah. Imagine I mean, trying to do valves on this thing. Oh my God. It, yeah. you, this is, it's just so simple that anybody could really wrench on it. And anybody that's else. that's the beauty of it, I, I think, is, is just how simplistic it is, how little there is to really damage on that motorcycle. Yeah. So I will say one of the weaknesses this bike has though is the seat height. Uh, I do find it to be a little bit tall for me. I'm six foot, 32 inch inseam, even though a lot of the internet doesn't seem to think that I am. And for me, it's a little bit tough to manage and maneuver it on the street. You gotta lean it over on one foot. Uh, Spite has a feel for someone your size. I mean, for someone my size, it's really not that big of a deal. I'm six foot three and I got a 34 inch inseam and it really does Every yeah, inch I mean, counts. It's, every it? inch counts. Uh, it also helps that we haven't adjusted the rear suspension, and it really squats under my weight. But it, you know, the the height of the bike is definitely an unfortunate sore spot because I wish more people could ride it. Uh, my girlfriend will never s throw her leg over a DRZ because she just doesn't like the fact that she can't touch the ground on no. it. Yeah. Uh, and it it really is unfortunate because it's so much fun yeah uh and and it really does limit its audience i mean you can get lowering links for that's the, gonna for that, but, but that's gonna compromise what it's meant to do you exactly know? and you're not going to be able to adjust that front end no. any so it you know you really can't get past the height it is uh it is really a limiting factor for people who are looking at a dual sport. You know, somebody who's under 5'6", no way. Somebody who's yeah. under 5'10", you're gonna have a hard time. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it really, there's no two ways around it. So, yeah. 
the, the height really is, is a drawback. I would say if you're interested in this type of motorcycle, a natural competitor and a cheaper competitor and one that is a bit lower is the CRF250L. So the CRF250L does have a lower seat height than this, but it's not gonna be as capable on an off-road environment as something like the DRZ400. But, you know, if you're just starting out, you're not gonna be really able to explore the limits of either machine. So if you are lower and you want a dual sport, CRF250L, great option. It's gonna get you 90% of the way there that a DRZ would as well. Uh, Spite, what's your rating on the DRZ, considering you bought one? This, is, this one is really hard to assign a rating to. Um, this motorcycle, I would probably give, for me, I'm gonna give it a seven out of 10. And that is because A, you're not taking it on any trips. B, uh, that, that 2.3 gallon gas tank is, is a bit of a bummer. Yeah. I always carry extra fuel on mine. But given that the DRZ is so modular, you can slap a huge adventure gas tank on it if you wanted to. Exactly. Right, so let's, let's point that out. Yeah, so there, there, is, there are options for more fuel. Uh, and, and again, that, that height and just the general lack of technology in it, yeah. it really kind of hold back what could be a great bike. You mentioned the CRF, and that's got fuel injection. Yeah. So it's- So it, does the WR. And so does the WR. And it, it's just, everybody's like, Oh, the carburetor is the best thing since sliced bread. It's really not. No, it's not. It's really not. <laughs> it's that's, a pain in the ass. That's why yeah. people pay a thousand bucks for electron carb. So you know, it's also why we've moved on from the carburetor, right? Exactly. Like, There's it's, a, it's just better. It's simpler. You know. You just push a button and the thing starts. This you gotta wait, and if it's cold, you gotta you know wait even more. Sometimes, like on mine, I had to kind of crank it, give it gas, crank it, give it gas. It would start and then stall, and then I'd crank it, give it more gas, and then it would wake up, and then it has to sit for five minutes. Carburetors are a pain in the butt. Someone's about to comment being like, you just don't know what your carburetor is doing, and you suck, and yeah, blah, somebody blah, blah. Needs, somebody needs to go with the, hit his carb with some carb clean and adjust the jets and blah, and yeah. all of that noise. It's just a pain in the ass. Yeah. But... If you can live with it, there's such a good bike under there. Totally agree. That, you know, it, it's it's just so much fun. Yeah. And it, it this it, is the most fun out of all of them, I think. It really can overcome its general lack of technology and, and its flaws just by going out and putting a smile on your face. It's why I bought one. Yep. Uh, but for anybody who's not willing to bear with that, this is like a four out of ten. Yeah. If you if you have to have fuel injection, if you're a shorter rider, you got to give the DRZ a miss, and it's just a crying shame that that's a fact. That's true. Yeah, I totally agree. I think if you're a very first time rider, uh, you know, again, maybe a little bit shorter, maybe you're not mechanically inclined, this is going to be a steep learning curve for you, and it's probably going to detract from some of the fun you're going to have on it as well. Also, consider the fact that. Uh, a lot of these, unless you were like us and bought it brand new at a dealership, you're going to be buying a used one, which is going to have even more issues and complications to it uh, than a brand new one would have. Like I'm thinking about yours, for example, you had to do a lot to it just to get it kind of ready to go. Yeah, you know? I mean, I probably dumped about four to five hundred bucks into mine before I could even get it registered. Yeah. So the DRZ is, and I mean, you're also talk about a bike that's going to come with a lot of mismatched bolts because oh it's going to rattle stuff free. I mean, it's just a, it's a really weird bike and I'm not sure it's value proposition for a new rider overcomes those quirks. Unless you know what you're getting into yeah. and you're willing to put up with them. In, ca in that case, of course, it's a great bike. Yeah. So there's really a duality in it. And you know, again, if we're trying to talk to who should own it, probably not your, it, it probably is not a great first bike. No, I wouldn't say so. Um, also considering that for this motorcycle, actually, when you get an exhaust on it and you get the carb right and you do the three by three mod and you know, it, it pulls pretty good in first and second gear right out of the gate. Uh, you can wheelie it pretty easy on power alone. And that for a beginner might be a little unsettling, you know? So I think I agree with you. I think for a first time rider, I would give it like a five out of 10 because it's just gonna be a steep learning curve. It's tall, it's a little kind of wonky. But as a second motorcycle, if you are a little bit more mechanically inclined and given the fact that you can just slap on a set of supermoto wheels onto this thing, I would give it like a hard nine out of 10 probably. Cause it's just for dollar for fun value, it's really hard to beat the DRZ. You could have just one DRZ in your garage and have it fulfill 
90% of what you want to do with the motorcycle, bar none. You can take it on trails, you can take it to the track, slap some supermoto wheels on it, drop it, wheelie it. You're gonna learn so much with this bike and that's what makes it awesome. But you know, again, it's got that dual flavor to it. So first time riders, I don't know. Second owners, this is it, dude. This is the bike to have. You can just learn so much with it. Yeah, it's the, it's the only motorcycle that I would call a tool yes. versus these are vehicles. That's a, that's a tool. Yeah. So guys, that's gonna wrap up our final thoughts on all three of these motorcycles. Remember, we are giving each of these bikes away. March 7th at 1159 is the last moment you have to enter to win them, so hit the links down below. Remember, Big Bosa 2019 gets you 10% and 10X entries on yamynoobmerch.com. Hit the link down below on yamynoob.co and you can sign up for a subscription package and get access to our Discord server. Join us on the fun. I'm there literally every day, aren't I, Spite? Pretty much, yeah. I'm there every goddamn day, <laughs> hanging out with people, talking with them, having a good time so if that's the best way you can to support our series and remember march 9th is when we're going to do our big reveal for our three new bikes and they are pretty sweet yeah you're not going to want to miss that that's going to be it's going to be a very exciting couple of months while we got those in the garage yeah i i, I don't want to you know call it just yet but it kind of blows these three out of the water it's it's a pretty good lineup so be sure to check that out thanks again for watching we'll catch you guys in the next one see you later